Thank you, Ryan. And thank you, Boston, for being so kind to us today. I arrived uh, at Harvard Business School uh, in very bad shape. I arrived four years after applying uh, as a member of the final internship class at Lehman Brothers, where they fired 3,000 people in my first week. I arrived after spending a year in the hallowed halls of Washington, D.C where I developed an uncanny knack for making copies and making coffee, uh, <laughs> making liberals and conservatives very upset. <laughs> I arrived after a failed attempt to help a Democrat become governor of Texas and a frustrating attempt to survive startup life in New York City on tuna fish and peanut butter. And even worse for some of you here today, I arrived at Harvard after graduating from Yale. <laughs> Very bad shape, indeed. And when I got here, I made two promises to myself. Do not work in another startup, and do not work in another nonprofit. And when I leave this place tomorrow, I will begin my full-time life at the helm of a startup nonprofit. <laughs> Don't clap. <laughs> so the question becomes very clear. What in the world has happened in the last two years? I spent a lot of time grappling with that question. But I didn't find the answer in any of the cases that we have read in the last two years. I traced it instead to a single moment on a single night almost seven years ago when my whole life changed. It was around 1.30 in the morning when I heard the first knock at the door of my home down in Dallas. I remember the next sound. It was a bang. And the next sound was a crash as that front door burst open. I remember how shocked I felt, how hard it was to breathe when I saw two thieves with guns pointed at my face. I remember how trapped I felt when I realized there wasn't anywhere to run, how totally helpless I felt as my head hit the floor and they tied my hands behind my back. I remember praying what I knew would be my final prayer and feeling so afraid of what was about to happen to me in this moment and in the darkness to come. But a strange thing happened as I accepted the fact that I was about to die. I stopped being afraid. It was in that moment that peace, a deep, still calm, washed over my body. It was just after that moment that I heard police sirens coming down the street and the two men scrambling to run out of the same door that they had just kicked in. It was because of that moment I now realize that I broke the promises that I made to myself when I first stepped foot on this campus. You see, up until that night, Fear had been driving me for a very long time. Fear that I wouldn't accomplish enough to make others love me. Fear that I wouldn't earn enough to repay the debts that I owed to so many who had sacrificed so much 
fear. That I would prove the teachers right who said when I got into Yale, there's no way that boy is going to graduate. He'll be home before the end of the first semester. They obviously had never heard of my dear friend, Mr. Grade Inflation. <laughs> this fear drove me to go harder, to go higher. It drove me to see my journey from Oak Cliff, Texas to Yale as a chance to leave behind all the challenges I had known and grab hold to a life of ease and comfort and security. But when I did not die on that floor, I began to ask myself why I had been allowed to live. And it struck me that if I had been judged that evening, I wasn't going to be asked how fancy my degrees had been, or how many people I had known, or how much money I had piled into my bank account. If that night had been my last, my maker would have peered into my heart to ask not what I had been able to get, but what I had been willing to give. And having nothing in my pockets then or now, I decided to give my life to a cause greater than myself. But I didn't know how to do that. And so one day in my junior year, I hurried over to Yale Law School, where I figured everyone had dedicated themselves to some grand cause or another. And the speaker that day was a lawyer, but he had come to give a very surprising message. If you wanted to change the world in the 20th century, he said, you had to go to law school. That's funny. But in the 21st century, if you want to change the world, go to business school. And so the next chance I got, I applied to this place, to Harvard. I thought it was the only thing to do, because I had read an old New Yorker interview with Peter Gomes, the iconic minister of Memorial Church, in which he said, I quote, this university was founded by Puritans fleeing England to create a new world order. They hoped that the world would reform itself in the light of New England. The light of New England was Boston. The heart of Boston was Cambridge. And the center of Cambridge was Harvard. Therefore, Harvard is the light of the world. And you stand in an unbroken procession stretching all the way back to Moses, who would himself have come to Harvard. <laughs> if it was good enough for Moses, I thought, <laughs> it was good enough for me. So here I came after my own years in the desert, tired, frustrated ready for an easier path. Some of you may have felt the same way. But something about this place, something about the last two years, convinced us to turn away from those paths and believe that there was a better, higher, harder way to go. It wasn't that Harvard Business School changed who we were. No, instead, I think, it reminded us who we could be. It reminded us that we didn't have to wait until we were rich or powerful or until we actually knew finance to make a difference. We could act right here, right now. It was here where the question was asked, when will we live in a world where gender equality is not the exception but the rule. And it was our Women's Student Association and our ambassadors who raised their voices to say, right now. It was here where the call for help rang out from cities like Detroit, Michigan, and Athens, Greece, and Cairo, Egypt, 
and elsewhere around the globe. And it was our classmates who raised their hands to say, I'm coming right now. It was here where tabloids wondered when would LeBron James attend an HBS book launch party? <laughs> when would Sir Alex Ferguson teach in an HBS classroom? Oh, when would Michael Douglas take one of us to the Super Bowl? <laughs> and to these great questions, it was our professor, Anita Albersi, and our dean, Nitin Nouria, who boldly replied, right now. <laughs> and it was here, in the dark corner of a section dinner party, where I found three brave and brilliant souls who decided to join me on an 8,000-mile journey to launch MBAs across America. We set out on this journey because we believed there was a serious challenge facing our generation, what my friend Andrew Mangino calls the Dream Depression. In the Great Depression of the 1930s, you see, folks would take their money and their valuables and hide them under their mattress and their floorboards. But now, in this Dream Depression, in a time of uncertainty the whole world over, folks are taking their dreams and their hopes and their aspirations and hiding them in all types of places, never to see the light of day. Well, we hit the road because we knew the dreams would not be found in a case or a cubicle. They'd be hiding in the nooks and crannies and in the unbeaten paths. So as we traveled, we saw the signs for countless big cities and tiny towns but we also saw the signs for hope. We saw the signs for hope in the fact that a black guy from Texas, a white guy from Maryland, a Jewish girl from New Mexico, and an Arab guy from Morocco could pitch a tent in a cow pasture in rural Montana. We realized that night that we were all in this together. We were tied to those ranchers as much as we were tied to the trumpet player in New Orleans, or the venture capitalist in Colorado, or the Lebanese man in the Middle Eastern restaurant in Romulus, Michigan, who thought that Harvard was in Ohio. We were tied to him, too. <laughs> we saw the signs for hope out there in entrepreneurs like Sebastian Jackson, who runs a barbershop that recycles the hair from clients to make compost and plant trees in some of Detroit's most blighted neighborhoods. He told us of his dream, not just to start a business that could save his family, but to grow a business that could save his city. And even though we did not have an expert opinion, even though we did not have any money to invest, even though some of us did not even have much hair. <laughs> he welcomed us in because he believed that four people from this place with this education had to be able to help him bring his dream to life. So when, after our time with him, Sebastian's revenue tripled, and he raised $100,000 from local investors. And he tore down an abandoned home and used the wood to renovate his barbershop. He called to say thank you. But he also left me with one message that I leave with you today. He said, Casey, you've got more work to do. So while I may never forget, what time it was when I heard that first knock at my door seven years ago. Right now is the time that I'm obsessed with today. Because now I see, after all the miles and all the memories of the last two years, now I see the biggest sign for hope. You, my friends, 
my fellow graduates, not because of what we've done, but because I know we have more work to do. In your hands, as well as mine, lies the hope for a new generation of business leaders in which each of us becomes a pioneer, in which each of us decides to travel unknown roads in search of unsolved challenges, in which each of us commits our time and talent not just to the treasures of today, but to the frontier of tomorrow, where new dreams and new hopes and new possibilities are waiting for us to pull them from the darkness. Yes, we have more work to do. And as we leave this place for the last time, some as Baker scholars and some by the seat of our pants, <laughs> we take up the work not just of making a living, but of making a life. For if all we've learned here are four Ps and five forces and six sigma, we will prove William Faulkner right that we labor under a curse, that we live not for love but for lust, for defeats in which nobody loses anything of value, for victories without hope and, worst of all, without pity or compassion, that our griefs grieve on no universal bones, leaving no scars, that we live not from the heart but from the glands. No, my friends, we have more work to do. Hard work, frightening work, uncertain work, unending work, work that may test us, work that may defeat us, work for which we may not get the credit, but work on which the whole world depends. And the time is short and the odds are long, but I believe that we are ready nonetheless. With the love of those who raised us, with the lessons of those who taught us, with the strength of those who stand beside us as we face what lies ahead, I say, let us begin. Thank you.